So this week we've got uh, regular week, three classes, um, but there's no quiz on Wednesday, unlike a lot of the Wednesdays this semester. Um, instead, there's a homework assignment due on Wednesday. Some of that is um, related to things that we've already discussed in class. Some of it is related to development um, and cell signaling. Um, depending on how things go, we're almost certainly not getting to development unless I break all of my records um, for today. Um, we may or may not get to cell signaling today. Um, but the stuff that you need to answer those questions is encapsulated in the book. Um, uh, it's sort of a general overview uh, of those questions. Um, the, the, one of them asks about distinction between G protein coupled receptors and G proteins. Um, the receptor is the thing that is um, transmembrane and so exposed to the outside and the inside of the cell. Um, it's got a lot of different integral membrane uh, components, but kind of like the integrins that we've talked about before, where here we have our extracellular um, fluid and then here we have our cytoplasm. Um, any kind of receptor is going to sense some chemical that's out here. The chemical sticks to the receptor, and then it activates some signal inside. Um, in the case of G-protein coupled receptors, that inside signal is a G-protein that hangs out in the membrane but, doesn't, but does not span the membrane. So there's no part of the G protein that hangs outside the cell, but the G protein coupled receptor is the receptor that sticks to the G protein, at least at first, and then connects it and, and conveys the information about the chemical uh, signal outside to the internal biochemistry that gets going on. Um, so that's, that's kind of the basics of one of those. And the other um, asked about um, uh, just organization of ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm um, in uh, before and after gastrulation. Um, and sort of as a, as a basic overview of that, um, uh, before gastrulation, they're just sort of stacked on top of each other like pancakes. After gastrulation, they're sort of layered like onions. Um, we're we're going to go into excruciating detail about that um, on Friday and also um, all of next week. Uh, or sorry, not all of next week, all of the week after Thanksgiving. Um, and you will get sick and tired of me hearing about stacked pancakes and layered onions and ectoderm and endoderm and mesoderm. Um, but for now, you just sort of need to think. There are figures in the books that show them the three layers stacked on top of each other before gastrulation, and then after gastrulation, they sort of layer around each other, sort of concentric spheres. Um, and so that's really all you need to know, or that's, sort of, that's, not, that's not all you need to know, but that's to sort of help point you to the right parts of the textbook um, to help you answer those questions that relate to things that we have not yet talked about. Um, any questions about anything in terms of what people have like looked ahead on the homework um, or the practice exam that's up, uh, the topics guide? We have an exam. So the exam is Monday. Um, there's a Sunday night. Uh, bless you. Sunday night at 9 p.m. Um, in Wien 4623 uh, is when the review session will be. It's going to be a question and answer review session just like all of the ones that we've had um, so far. Uh, and so come with questions or else we just stare at each other for an hour. Um, uh, there's also um, a bonus homework assignment about Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium that is due on Wednesday as well. Um, that's worth a couple of bonus points, and plus there's going to be one bonus point on the exam related to that. Um, just to sort of give you a sense of what kinds of questions I might ask about that on the exam, the practice test actually has three different questions related to that, even though it's only worth one point on the final thing. Just since it's something we haven't talked about in class, I wanted to give you a little bit more opportunity to sort of think about what we, what will be asked about on that bonus question. Um, yeah, anyway, questions about any of that upcoming stuff? Yeah, sure. Here, yes, yeah. So, economy, we, we got, I, I was able to get it that first time, but yeah, we'll just be back here for the, this exam. And then that's the last exam, except for the final. And I don't even, I don't think the registrar's posted rooms for the final, but I, don't, I have no idea where that will be. They'll tell us on the registrar schedule. But yeah, exam three is here a week from today. Other questions? <coughs> okay, so this week um, we're going to. Um, finish up talking about um, sex and sexual reproduction and the evolutionary 
consequences and caveats and so on associated with sex and sexual reproduction, um, and then move into um, talking about communication between cells, um, which is kind of like what I drew over here, where one cell releases a chemical. That chemical might be relatively large, like a small, like a protein, like insulin, um, or that chemical might be comparatively pretty small, something like uh, you know serotonin or norepinephrine or something like that. Um, that is uh, you know about the size of a large amino acid, rather than than 50 or 200 amino acids strung together like insulin is. Um, and so, uh, but either way, uh, through mechanisms like what we talked about already when we talked about how cells secrete proteins in the last unit, um, uh, cells communicate with each other by either secreting proteins or secreting smaller chemicals, um, and then those proteins or small chemicals bind to an integral membrane protein on some receiving cell that then receives the signal and converts it into some sort of change in the biochemistry of what goes on inside the cell. And the homework assignment and the book also talk about second messengers, which are the internal signals in the cell. So we'll be talking about that uh, either end of class today or for sure on Wednesday. Um, and then uh, later part of Wednesday through into Friday, we'll be talking about development. And there are two aspects of development. There are actually a lot of aspects of development that we're going to be talking about because the entire week after Thanksgiving is all about development as well. Um, but in this unit this week, we'll be thinking about development in terms of genetics and activation of genes and transcription factors, um, and also in terms of signals that cells send to one another and how the signals that one cell sends might turn on a transcription factor, which then turns on some more genes inside the cell and changes the way the cell does its biochemistry. Um, and as a result of those signals and as a result of those genetic events, <clears throat> What starts out as an undifferentiated um, uh, ball of cells, you know, two, uh, 200 cells, or initially one cell, and then two, and then four, and then eight, and then 16, and so on, um, all of which um, have the capacity to turn into any type of tissue in your body, um, a small embryo, um, those cells make decisions that commit them to being skin or brain or heart or muscle or bone or, um, uh, or stomach or whatever they turn into, um, liver, pancreas, all the different organs and tissues in your body. Um, and so we'll, um, we'll begin that discussion on Friday. Uh, and whatever we talk about on Friday um, is up for grabs in terms of material for the exam on Monday. Um, but then uh, the following week, we're going to go even more into depth about, um, about development as well. Yeah. Anyway, questions about sort of the plan for this week? All right, cool. So today I want to finish up from, uh, from the, there, there are already up on Canvas um, the PowerPoint presentation from, from Friday uh, of last week, which is where I'm starting, and then also um, uh, the cell signaling, cell communication one, I think is what I posted on the calendar in terms of Monday, and then Wednesday is the development one, but that one's going to continue on over into Friday. Um, so we've already talked about um, genetic drift quite a bit, and also about these ideas of bottlenecks, where small, um, small what are called founder populations, if a small group breaks off, even if that small group that breaks off is genetically, has the same mix of alleles as the larger parent population, because genetic drift is such a strong evolutionary force in small populations, or um, that, uh, that new satellite population or new founder population um, will evolve much more rapidly and much more randomly than the parent population does. Um, we also talked about um, uh, uh, hybrid vigor um, and heterozygote advantage in the context of um, sickle cell anemia. Um, actually, this was actually just remember that we didn't fully finish even talking about this, so I'll go, come back and talk about that a little bit more. Um, and then we'll talk about sex and sexual selection. <clears throat> um, so actually, yeah, back up here, sorry, to hybrid vigor, first of all. Um, this idea of heterozygote advantage. Um, uh, so, um, so we talked about malaria. <clears throat> 
And in the book, um, they talked about a lot of different ways that um, humans have evolved against uh, to, to, to fight malaria. Um, there are a variety of different ones um, that the book alludes to. Um, there's the sickle cell one that we'll talk about in, uh, in the most detail here, but there's also Duffy antigens, um, uh, heterozygous for this G6PD gene, and so on. Um, <clears throat> um, but the one that I, I guess started to introduce last Friday but want, and wanted to continue is talking about um, what's called sickle cell anemia and sickle cell trait. And so um, I, I wrote this up before, but there, there are th three, there are actually more than three, but we'll sort of think about three alleles for hemoglobin. Um, hemoglobin is the protein that makes up um, the vast majority of red blood cells. Um, actually, like anything that's alive, about 70% of red blood cells is water. Um, but if you take out all the water, what's left, about 90% of what's left is hemoglobin. Um, so uh, so the, the non-water weight of red blood cells is basically all hemoglobin, which means red blood cells are kind of like little, almost crystals of hemoglobin. Actually, Crystal implies that they're solid. They're sort of fluid matrix. They're sort of dissolved fluid matrix of hemoglobin. Um, and in the hemoglobin gene, there is a single mutation that, um, so, so there's, there's, there's two alleles. Um, one is the A allele. Um, and this is the most common allele in all populations, even in populations where malaria is, uh, is um, uh, highly prevalent and has been a strong evolutionary force for many, many generations. Um, because the S allele is so bad, the A allele is the most common in, in populations. Um, and this common uh, ha um, A allele has a particular amino acid that's a glutamic acid uh, or glutamate amino acid. And if you remember, or as you just sort of can infer from the name, it's an acid. It's got uh, an extra H plus that it dumps off when it's in water. And so it carries a negative charge and is therefore soluble in water. And also, sort of hemoglobin molecules have a little bit of repulsion against each other, which keeps them from sticking together because of this glut glutamic acid uh, in them. Um, and then the other allele is S allele. Um, this is rare. Um, the the um, variable between different populations. In some populations, it's exceptionally rare. In populations uh, of humans that have evolved in areas where malaria is, uh, is not common, the S allele um, is zero or close to zero percent of the population. Um, in other populations where malaria is endemic and there's been malaria for, for many, many generations, the S allele uh, might constitute one to two percent-ish of the population, which is still pretty rare, but is um, uh, but is much more uh, uh, much more common than in than in places where there's no advantage, as we'll see, to the S allele. Um, and so uh, and so at that particular amino acid, there's a single uh, base change that converts the glutamate to a valine. Does anyone remember what family valine falls into in terms of amino acids? Uh, sure, yeah. Yeah, it's hydrophobic. It's, uh, it's just all hydrogens and carbons. Um, so valine is less soluble in water than glutamate is. Um, and because our red blood cells are packed, crammed full of hemoglobin, um, so, so this gives us actually three, three different possible genotypes, AA, um, AS, and SS. Um, and if you happen to have SS genotype, then your hemoglobin is not very soluble. And as a result, as your red blood cells pass through capillaries, um, the red blood cells deform, the hemoglobin gets squished together a little bit, and then it, and then it precipitates. It, it turns into a solid rather than staying in this fluid dissolved state. Um, and so these uh, red blood cells take on this uh, sort of pointy or curved arced sickle shape. A sickle is just sort of this tool that's got a curve to it. Um, and, so, um, and so we call this sickle cell <coughs> anemia. Um, and sickle cell anemia um, is, is, uh, is a deadly 
um, a deadly disease. There are some ways to manage the disease, but, um, but for most people with sickle cell anemia, um, especially without access to a lot, of, uh, a lot of care, and even with access to, to a lot of advanced medical care, um, you're talking about a lifespan of four to maybe 12 years or something. Um, so people that are SS um, are, are not surviving to reproduce. <coughs> um, people that are AA, that's sort of our comparison point. That's our control. So because it's the most common genotype, um, that's, that's uh, uh, the most, even, even in places where the S allele is comparatively common, um, uh, still, uh, you know, if 95% of the alleles are A, then, uh, then let's see, 0.9, then, then at least uh, uh, 87 or so percent of the people are going to be uh, AA in their genotype. So that's sort of our, our baseline comparison point, um, which is these, these red blood cells here, here that have the sort of like frisbee shape to them. Um, so, however, if you happen to have AS, then this goes, uh, then, then what this is sometimes referred to is called sickle cell trait. You know, it doesn't, I, I'm not sure that it fits neatly into these incomplete dominance, co-dominant. It's hard to say where you want, it, it becomes a semantic argument how you want to classify it in the sort of traditional Mendelian nomenclature and extensions on Mendelian nomenclature that we talked about last unit. Um, but, but what happens with sickle cell trait is two things. First of all, um, most of the time you have uh, uh, people with sickle cell trait are asymptomatic. Um, so usually no symptoms. Um, but if somebody with sickle cell trait, so, um, but, there's, but, but, but half of their hemoglobin has this valine in it. So there's this slight, um, slightly reduced oxygen capacity for, in your blood. Because the hemoglobin, especially under conditions where you're putting your red blood cells under stress, um, your hemoglobin will start to um, do what sickle cell anemia hemoglobin does all the time, which is um, uh, clump together. Um, and so, um, and so um, people with sickle cell trait can go through their entire lives without even knowing that they are carriers um, for the S allele. Um, it's often referred to as recessive, but, um, but as we'll see, that's not quite right. Um, but there was, uh, so um, he's retired now, but about uh, 10 years ago, one of the safeties, uh, one of the defensive players for the Pittsburgh Steelers, um, Ryan Clark, um, uh, so football player, um, uh, went to Denver um, to play at Mile High Stadium, where it's high elevation, um, and collapsed on the field. Uh, nobody knew why, and uh, it turned out that they later determined that he had what was called a sickle cell attack. Um, and so, unbeknownst to him, he was a carrier for the sickle cell trait. Um, and uh, being a carrier for sickle cell trait, he could um, do a ton of aerobic exercise and anaerobic exercise um, at sea level or close to sea level in Pittsburgh. Um, but when he's put in low oxygen conditions, like you find at high elevations, um, then his red blood cells are sort of taxed to the limit, um, and therefore um, the, some of them start to, uh, to sort of clump up in his blood vessels, um, and he had to have his gall gallbladder and spleen removed, um, which are two organs that, um, red, that sort of are involved in recycling hemoglobin and red blood cells. <clears throat> um, and so... Um, and so people with sickle cell uh, trait um, can have sickle cell attacks. And these usually happen at, at, at high altitude. But otherwise, typically are asymptomatic. <coughs> the other thing that sickle cell um, has, oh yeah, sorry, yes. Yeah, so when, when the, so actually what happens is um, it turns out that, that uh, I sort of skipped over this a little bit, but the solubility of the hemoglobin depends on how much oxygen is associated with it. And when there's more oxygen associated with the hemoglobin, um, then, it's, then it's a little bit better soluble. Um, but as you 
pump it through your system uh, at a very high rate in an environment where there's less oxygen. Um, the oxygen's getting stripped away by the tissues because you're doing aerobic exercise. It's not getting replenished from the air. And so the hemoglobin solubility for everybody drops ever so slightly um, when you're, um, uh, when you're uh, um, doing aerobic exercise. Um, but, if you're, but if you're sort of at a tipping point because of the sickle cell trait, then that can cause the hemoglobin then to start clumping up. So, so the, the oxygen typically helps a little bit with the solubility. That, that help goes away. Yeah, other questions about that before we talk about, um, yeah, questions about sickle cell so far. Yeah, sure. Is it kind of like yeah, yeah. So, so, I mean, this is, yeah, this is, um, so this gl glutamate, this glutamic acid, amino acid, um, hangs out on the surface. It turns out that when you put a valine in, because it's surrounded by other water-soluble amino acids, that doesn't completely reshape the protein and force that into the middle. Instead, what you've got is you've just got a valine on the surface where there should be a gl glutamic acid. If I substitute a bunch of amino acids, then it might completely refold the protein. But in this case, it doesn't completely refold the protein. I've just got this exposed valine. And that exposed valine then is going to make it so that that hemoglobin is a a little bit less capable of interacting well with the water um, and a little bit more likely to stick to other hemoglobin molecules and form these, these um, toxic aggregates of hemoglobin. Yeah, sure. So a follow-up on that question, actually. So when we're, do we're talking about the proteins that are being folded and deformed, is it specifically the spectrins that are being deformed and affected in the blood cell matrix, or is that a different protein? Um, so the hemoglobin is what's first, and this is a mutation in the hemoglobin. The hemoglobin is what first deforms, but once the hemoglobin starts to deform, so spectrins are part of the um, cell, cell cytoskeleton, their class of intermediate filaments, um, which we sort of skipped over. But once the, um, once the hemoglobin condenses, what happens is the, um, the cytoskeleton of the red blood cell um, also starts to reorganize. And so then even when you put the hemoglobin, even when you put the, the cells back in a place, where, back, back, in, back in a space where they're not being squeezed, um, the, he, the hemoglobin might try to resolubilize, but the cytoskeleton is like gotten through this more permanent reformation. And then that causes the red blood cells to still get sort of stuck to each other um, and, and can't pass through the capillaries very effectively and so on. Yeah. I mean, the point being just, you know, SS, your blood, red blood cells are in trouble. They're dying all the time. AS, your red blood cells are fine unless you put them under stressful conditions. Yeah. Other questions about that? Okay, so um, it turns out that um, because hemoglobin doesn't operate in a vacuum, um, uh, one of the um, there, there are protein. There's, a, there's an integral membrane protein called PFEMP1, um, uh, which is uh, 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 peripheral uh, something uh, erythrocyte membrane protein one. Um, so erythrocyte just means red blood cell membrane protein. So it's not a terribly informative name, um, but uh, what this what this protein does, um, along with some of the others, is <coughs> it serves some function in in helping your red blood cells communicate with the environment. But malaria um, has taken advantage of that surface protein to identify red blood cells. And remember, malaria wants at certain stages of its life, cy life cycle wants to find red blood cells, go inside them, and eat away all the hemoglobin so that it can continue to reproduce. And so if it turns out through mechanisms that are not fully understood, if your hemoglobin is mutated, then you also have less surface, uh, less of this surface PFEMP1 membrane protein. So let's get rid of our G protein for a second here. And we've just got here this, this peripheral um, uh, erythrocyte membrane protein 1 um, that spans the membrane. And so when malaria is trying to figure out, it's bumping around into a bunch of cells, it doesn't want to go into your white blood cells or get killed there. It doesn't want to go into to, um, you know, your, your, uh, your liver cells. It's not, well, actually, at some points it does. It doesn't want to go into your, um, doesn't want to go into your kidney cells because there's not a big snack of hemoglobin for it to eat on in, uh, in your liver cells or in your kidney cells. Um, but it does want to find red blood cells to go in and find that hemoglobin to eat it all up because that's what the, the red blood cells lunch is. Or sorry, the malaria lunches. And so um, the malaria will stick to this and then, ah, this is a red blood cell. Okay, I'll go inside this one and go eat up all the hemoglobin. 
Um, and so if you happen to have fewer of these membrane proteins on your red blood cells, then malaria won't, um, uh, won't be able to find your red blood cells as effectively. And so if you get infected with malaria, you're, it's less likely to um, give you strong symptoms. Um, it's less likely that the malaria parasite will reproduce in your body to the point that um, it'll, be, it'll reach high enough levels that, a, that it'll end up in a mosquito that bites you later. And so you're not going to pass it on via a mosquito to somebody else as much, as well as being resistant to the infection yourself. Um, and so a, this AS allele, in addition to uh, you know, this problem at high altitudes has this advantage if you're in a malaria-rich uh, environment, which is that you're resistant to malaria infections. Um, and so we call this <clears throat> heterozygote advantage. Um, and this is not the only example of this. If you take two strains of wheat that are both four feet tall and breed them together, more often than not, you'll end up with some five foot tall wheat strain because the mixing of genetic information um, creates a, a, a new hybrid wheat strain or corn or whatever that has more different proteins running around and it's able to do more diverse biochemistry that gives it an advantage. Yeah, so anyway, questions about that? A lot of that was in the book and also from the homework that was due last week. Yeah, sure. Is the actual like, um, shape and the clumping of the hemoglobin related to resistance to malaria, or is it just mm -hmm. that trait happens to come along with it? No, it just, yeah. <laughs> the second one, and nobody, and nobody has a good handle on why. It's only relatively recently that we've even figured out that this hemoglobin allele alters surface proteins, and nobody's yet figured out why changing hemoglobin alleles alters the surface proteins at all. But it seems like the altered surface protein is what's actually the, the beneficial thing in terms of malaria. Um, people with SS are actually even more resistant to malaria, but they've got this other problem of dying by the time they're age 12, so it's not that much of a benefit um, at that point. Yeah, other questions? Okay, so um, <clears throat> yeah, so the, the, the second, the next topic for today is sort of more things about related to sex and sexual reproduction and evolution. Um, so, <clears throat> first of all, um, not every animal, let alone every organism, right? Uh, fungi and, and especially and, and single-celled organisms mostly don't have sex. Um, there's, a, there's a sense in which bacteria and some single-celled organisms do have sex because they exchange genetic information, um, but sex in terms of sexual reproduction is something that um, plants, most fungi, and, um, uh, and animals do, but, and a few other branches of eukaryotes do. But most um, eukaryotes and all prokaryotes um, reproduce asexually. Um, there are some uh, organisms that have, uh, so um, uh, for example, um, these, uh, these here are Amazon, or actually these here are whiptail lizards, first of all. The whiptail lizards, they're all female. Um, but they evolved from a male and female mixed population. Um, and uh, at some point, some of the females were able to um, uh, reproduce via what's called parthenogenesis, where they produce um, eggs that are 100% from their own genetic material. Um, for them, it wasn't a disadvantage, and actually, as we'll see in a second, actually can be an advantage. Um, but, um, but they sometimes, with each other, will perform sex-like behaviors um, so they're sometimes called the lesbian lizards, um, um, which is, I don't know, but anyway, um, that's the term sometimes applied to it, where they, apply, they, 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 they do sex-like behaviors with each other. Um, nobody's quite sure why, because it doesn't relate to, um, uh, to reproduction, um, but it may be a social sort of, a social thing um, among those animals. Um, there's actually... All, uh, plenty of other examples. Uh, male giraffes have sex with other male giraffes way more often than they have with females. Um, uh, but anyway, there's um, uh, 
Uh, it's yeah, it, there, a lot, a lot of organ. The diversity of life is is kind of amazing, but that's not for reproduction. Um, anyway, um, these are uh, Amazon mollies. Um, they live in the Amazon River, um, and they are all female, um, but they will. Um, encourage males, they have external, they lay eggs, and then they will encourage males of related species that look like them to fertilize those eggs and care for those eggs, even though the eggs don't get any genetic information from the males, um, and just, um, so they mimic females of the species that these males do belong to, um, and they sort of trick the males into fertilizing their eggs, um, uh, but all of the genetic information from the eggs comes just from them. Um, there's also clownfish, um, where the, the oldest, largest in a group is the female, um, and every other is a male. Um, and so the female lays a lot of eggs, and then the males um, will fertilize it. And then when the female dies, the dominant male remaining switches to female. Um, frogs kind of have something similar that they sometimes do. I don't really know. I mean, yeah, there's some sort of, there's some, there's some hormonal, pheromonal communication that goes on. Um, but, yeah, I don't know the full mechanism for how that happens. Somebody, I didn't, I didn't see who asked that, but yeah, yeah, sure. How is it like beneficial for most like wizards where they trick For the mollies, you mean? So these don't trick males. They, these are all female, and they do this like social sex thing that doesn't have any genetic information exchange. The fish? Um, oh, because male fish, so with external fertilization, um, male fish. Um, see themselves fertilize the eggs, and many male fish um, will, care, will care for offspring um, because they have um, um, uh, uh, high certainty about paternity. Um, and so, um, in this case, they get free babysitting out of it, essentially. So, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, anyway, other questions about that? So, anyways, it's, it, animals have a lot of differences in the way they do that. Yeah, sure. I have no idea. Yeah, I don't, I'm not sure that that's been very well studied, and I don't really know. Um, if, you, if anybody finds out, I'd be very curious to hear about that. I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure there's a long Wikipedia article about these that probably does reference all of the available data about it. Other questions? Okay, so... so um, in thinking about sex and sexual reproduction, from just a numerical point of view, sex seems like a bad idea. Um, and so to, to, there are a couple different ways to illustrate this. One is actually, if we even just think about one generation. So, so um, uh, you know, uh, since females, by definition, are the, um, uh, are the uh, um, members of a species that produce large gametes um, that include all of, the, um, uh, all of the organelles and so on that are necessary for life. Um, if something is asexual, then it's um, much closer to being female than male. Um, sperm doesn't have anything but genetic information. And it takes more than just DNA to live. <clears throat> um, so sex seems like a bad idea um, uh, because, first of all, if a, uh, if a single organism can, in its lifetime, in her lifetime, a single female organism can produce four offspring, um, then um, if she reproduces asexually, then every one of those offspring is going to have 100% of her genetic information. And so if you think about, um, you know, uh, from, from when, we, when we're thinking about evolution and change in allele frequency over time, um, as an organism trying to pass my genes on as much as possible, um, which is maybe not necessarily everybody's goal, but from an evolutionary perspective, the most success in terms of having the most offspring means having the most genes passed on. Um, if every offspring, well, I'm male, so this doesn't apply to me, but if every offspring that a female has has all of her genetic information, then she's got, she's passed on 100% of her genetic information four times. 
Um, if instead this female needs a male to reproduce and still produces four offspring, then she um, has, um, then she, uh, um, on average, half of them are male, but, but there's already a cost to her in the next generation, which is that each one of these organisms only has half of her genetic information. So, um, so in terms of like disadvantages to sex, um, you're only 50% related to offspring. So you're only passing on half of your genes to each child that you have. Um, so your genes are not being as heavily represented in the next population if you have to split genetic information with a partner. Um, in addition to that, um, if you have a population of all females, this female has four offspring, then each of her four offspring has four offspring. Now we're up to 16 in the next generation. And then in the next generation after that, we're at 16 times 4, which is 64 offspring. And then the next generation, we're at 256 offspring. Um, and so um, in... In five generations, we've gone from one, per, one female to 256 females. Um, here, in this case, we've gone from one female to four organisms, to eight organisms, to then 16, then, uh, then 32, then 64. So after five generations, instead of having 256, we only have 64. Um, so because a half of the children are unable to bear offspring themselves, that cuts in half the, um, uh, the, the, the number of children born at every generation. Does that make sense? Um, so in, in other words, the females are the only ones bearing children, and so half of the offspring in a sexually reproducing situation, can't bear children themselves. They can still contribute genetic information if they find a partner, but they can't bear children by themselves. So you would think if there was one female organism in a population that figured out a way to reproduce asexually, um, you come back 50 years or 100 years or whatever, some number of generations later, all of her great 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 granddaughters would be would be everywhere, and there would be only a couple a couple sexual reproducers left in the population. Does that make sense? Yeah. Questions about that? Yes. Yes. Um, there are ways in which genetic information can get shuffled around within, but we'll just sort of stick with the cloning kind of situation where, where it's an exact copy, like, a, like an identical twin that happens to also be your daughter kind of thing. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Other questions about that? Okay, so, so, so the numbers tell us that sex shouldn't exist. So then why does it is the question. And so let's take six minutes or so um, and brainstorm with your groups what might be some evolutionary advantages to sexual reproduction? <laughs> yeah, fill, pa papers, names, turn them in at the end of class. <laughs> Hey, I um, ran out of time alphabetizing these. I got them all entered, but I didn't alphabetize them. But I do want to hand them back. Can you try and, uh, like, they're sort of roughly alphabetized, but can you try and, like, uh, organize them so people can get them from you at the end of class? Oh, about the, the, the 15th, or wait, 24, oh, 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 oh um, about, about 12-1, about no, December 1st, yes. Friday, yes, Friday after Thanksgiving, yes, yeah. <coughs>
It's because it's because you're not having as many grandchildren. So, from in the single organism's perspective, I want to have as many grandchildren and great grandchildren and great great grandchildren as possible. So the the alleles that I carry just come to dominate, every, so that everybody looks like me in a few generations. Is sort of the self interest perspective. Um, yeah. But what if what if the person producing asexually their traits aren't that great, but the one who's producing sexually the that great. that's um, I mean that that's maybe yeah I mean that that's a good point that's a good that, that that's maybe an advantage um, but yeah but I mean I guess um, yeah but but so it's sort of from a selfish perspective maybe sex is better but maybe from a or maybe asexual is better but from an or from a population perspective maybe maybe sexual reproduction is better for that reason yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so more. I mean, the the more grandchildren or great grandchildren or whatever means more of my alleles that are in the population over time. Yeah. Yeah. But but there might not. But but yeah. I mean, there's obviously some reason because yeah. Uh, maybe about one more minute to finish up your discussions. Yeah. What's up? So, Dr. Frazier, would sexual selection be an advantage of sexual reproduction? Maybe. Or is that not technically correct? Why? Sexual selection is more like a mechanism rather than like a goal. Well, I mean, I guess, so you have to explain why sexual selection makes the next... scrubs out of the population. Okay, sure, yeah. To get some scrubs out. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's... um, That actually is true, like in, like in, um... Some monkey species, like chimpanzees, ninety-five percent of the reproduction happens by the top five percent of the males. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So all the scrubs don't get to reproduce. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. That, that technically improves the, the quality. Well, of the yeah. Fitness. That I mean, that's a yeah. I think that's a reasonable that's which, a reasonable thing which, to put down. Yeah. Overall, increase the quality of the fitness of the people. Like yeah. Kind of like how um, neural networks are like AI, like those things, like over time develop and become better. That's a rough analogy, but yeah, I think you're right. I, yeah, yeah. I think that makes sense. Am I ever- All right, cool. Um, Okay, so as you're finishing up, okay, so, so what are some of the advantages to sexual reproduction that uh, people came up with in their groups? Sure, yeah. Genetic diversity, okay. Um, Do you want to say a little bit more about why you think that's a good thing? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and uh, uh, so, right. So, if there's um, another another way to say that is if if there's something if there's something wrong with this female, then there's a lot of organisms that look like her in a few generations. And so that's um, yeah. And so uh, and so that's a challenge. Um, uh, yeah, we might come back to that a little bit uh, in, in in a minute. But yeah, I think that's a great advantage. Other thoughts about what. Sure. Uh, another advantage of sex is we can look at evolution on a macro scale, so a micro scale, because the time span of the organisms sort of reproduction cycle is a little longer, rather than just uh, <clears throat> asexual reproducing it takes time. So slower reproduction. Why is that good? Because if if the organism were to reproduce uh, immediately, like a bacteria does, then there is more chance for mistakes to occur throughout the actual process. <coughs> 
a slower regrowth just like will allow for a more accurate or precise. Yeah, that's. I, I would say that that's. That's a, a reasonable idea. It's one that's controversial, and we won't really get into the controversy about this as to whether or not there's such a thing as group selection. Evolution, if you want to get a bunch of evolutionary biologists to fight with each other, you can just go in and say, who thinks there's group, sele group selection is the thing or not? Um, and you can get a lot of different perspectives on this. But this sort of provides a sort of, it's an advantageous for the group kind of, kind of situation. Um, yeah, sure. Um, that reproduction is slower, which allows for more development which would allow for more complex organisms. Yeah, allows, um, I mean, so... Assuming the group exists to prevent that reproducing female from dying. Oh Yeah, more complex organisms. I mean, I think that that's an interesting observation, an interesting perspective. I think that in principle there's no reason why you can't have long development with cloning uh, like this, um, but, um, but more complex organisms... For sure, one thing that, that you, you might have noticed is that as I was lifting the, 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 air, the parts of the um, uh, tree of life where sexual reproduction happens, it happens in animals, it happens in plants, it happens in fungi, and most single cell organisms don't. So it seems like there's certainly some correlation between being large and complicated. Yeah. Yeah, so so um, social um, social bonding. I mean, this might be why those those female whiptail lizards do the uh, do this sort of sex like behavior. Um, yeah, other thoughts about this? I, I know I heard a couple other ideas out there while I was walking around. Um, sure, yeah. Quicker evolution. Yeah. So. Right, so quicker evolution. Yeah, we'll come back to that in just a second. Um, I saw one more hand up over there somewhere. I know you had another idea, so I'll just call on you with that. So. Um, sexual selection is an advantage of sexual reproduction. Sort of on the macro scale because it ensures like the scrubs with bad genes can reduce. So, sexual, the sexual selection against, um, yeah, sure. I was <laughs> I'll just yes. sure. Why not? <laughs> I guess this, so. So um, yeah. I mean. Uh, so if you if you read the book, they call this the, the the name that the book gives this. At least in an earlier edition, I think still here. This is called the purifying selection hypothesis. Well, <laughs> Maybe yes. Actually, fair <laughs> enough. Um, uh, um, so the idea is. That, um, that any, especially for males, but also for females too, any male um, that is sick um, has a genetic disease is not going to reproduce um, because they can't put on these fancy displays. They're too busy fighting off their cold or dealing with their, um, their genetic disease. Um, did you have a hand up or are you just putting your coat, just putting your coat on? Okay. Um, uh, okay, so also, so that's, that's one side of it. Um, uh, and these are, uh, so sort of related to the social bonding and especially the genetic diversity. The other thing that the book describes um, is that, um, so, so actually, sort of, we think back to genetic diversity, and we'll, and we'll come back to, since there's only a couple minutes left, we'll kind of come back to this at the beginning of class next time. Um, but <clears throat> if this female is perfectly adapted to her environment and has every possible useful trait in her genome, no genetic diseases whatsoever, then in theory, all of her children should be perfectly adapted, and all of their children should be perfectly adapted, and everything's fine. There are problems, though, when the environment starts to change. And when the environment starts to change, genetic diversity, this sort of relates to this quicker evolution as well, genetic diversity is very important in a changing environment. Um, if the environment starts to change and every organism is exactly the same, then they're maybe all going to live through the change or maybe all going to die. Um, but if the environment is changing quite a lot, then um, 
clones of each other. This is why bananas that are, are at risk and, and so on, um, organisms that are genetically identical are all going to be susceptible to the same environmental challenges. 